Hi, Misha here, and back in the spring, I had kind of an idea for a unique and different video for this channel, but life got in the way, and only now at the end of September, I'm going to record it. The problem is we haven't had any new guns to really talk about, and the guns that are out there are really expensive, and on top of that, it's been really hot. But I also recognize that just going into histories and bolt actions, you know, why I enjoy it can't be everything. So in this video, as the title suggests, I wanted to talk about what the Soviet and later Russian infantry squadrons issued as standard small arms. Specifically, I wanted to talk about the motorized or motor infantry squadron which rode into battle on the quite revolutionary BMP-1 and also mention some about the airborne assault battalions the VDV which used an even more unique craft called the BMD starting with the one and working their way up through four. Those were uh, infantry fighting vehicles, and really Russia kind of pioneered that concept to a great extent, especially for the airborne, because they could literally drop them with parachutes, if they remembered to put them on, out of aircraft. I mean, you saw Red Dawn, the, the good one, not the crappy new one. You know what it means. And they also had the BTR and BTRD, respectively, which were more like armored transports. In fact, that's kind of what the name stands for, is armored transporter. And just the, the whole Soviet doctrine is kind of interesting. And we're going to go through three eras. The, uh, the BMP and BTRs really didn't start to see widespread production and use until the 70s. So we're going to look at the first era here. Then we'll look at the 1980s and 90s, kind of Afghan war and immediately after. And then finally we'll look at the late 90s and early 2000s. And just kind of talk about the roles, the positions, you know, what is going on here. And I will touch upon the armor a bit, but this is mostly focusing on how the firearms relate to the soldiers in the armor. So kind of that thing. I don't know, I thought it was fun, and it's interesting to look at foreign military doctrines, especially because they were applied in Afghanistan, and we've seen quite a bit of recent Soviet-style tactics, even in the hands of the modern Russians, in the 21st centuries, too. So with that, let's talk about, a little bit, the BTR and the BMP, and then we'll talk about the guns. Those who visited my personal channel know that I have several die-cast models of aircraft and some uh, naval vessels. What I do not have are armor. And real quick, I did check last night to see if I could find an example in die-cast of the BTR, the Armored Transport or Transporter. I could not, not real quick anyway. So as a stand-in, because I also have sci-fi, we'll use this. Again, just having fun, guys. The ATOT from Star Wars. Why not? Because they're actually very similar. It, you know, a lot of the stuff in sci-fi is inspired by real-world things, and this is too. The original BTR. Yeah. In the 1950s, the Russian army decided they wanted to go to mechanized infantry, and so one of the first things they selected was an APC. Developed began in 1955. Several designs were considered, but in 1959 they chose the BTR, also known as the Gaz 49. It was more of an evolutionary step forward from earlier uh, APC types. They used 4x4s and other armored vehicles during World War II and during the Korean period. It wasn't revolutionary. Several other designs in Russia were more advanced, but they wanted to go with something a little more easily mass produced. It was an open topped vehicle for the crew compartment, for, excuse me, for the uh, uh, troop compartment. So that's why I actually picked this one because it's open too. It's fun. 
and the crew compartment was uh, at, le at least had a roof. The uh, the troop compartment could be covered by canvas if it was bad weather or sunny or whatever, kind of like a lot of American vehicles. Uh, one interesting feature: it was amphibious, but just now the uh, the BTR was an eight-wheeled vehicle and if it needed to go over water it used kind of a water jet system but it really needed calm water to work properly and of course being a wheeled vehicle it was perfectly good on roads it could get up to about 50 miles per hour off-road cross-country of course there's always the danger of being stuck because wheels but it was about 30 miles per hour off-road maximum maybe 25 in in water it was about six miles per hour so yeah not bad the crew was a commander and a driver initially and in the back initially it could carry 14 armed soldiers and it was about a 15 ton vehicle about 25 feet long and about nine feet wide so yeah pretty pretty long eventually yeah not not too far from this Introduced in 59, it went into full production in 1960. That would be the BTR-60P. And for defense, it had armor. And for guns, it had three mounts for 7.62 machine guns. One to the front and uh, one on each side. That was about it. It's an open-topped truck, essentially. But it was used by the mechanized infantry for a long time. But a new version... Another Star Wars model. Why not? Just to represent. Hey, this one at least has wheels. Yay. <laughs> this is the clone tank, although it's really a personnel carrier, too. They introduced the uh, BTR-60. Well, first the PA, and it had a roof for the troop compartment. Yay. And uh, this had much better protection for the crew it even gave limited protection for chemical warfare it required that the side machine gun mounts be moved to the top and the front machine gun mount was moved to the top as well and this could be a heavy machine gun like a 12.7 millimeter and at this point a lot of times the crew would increase to three one gunner commander and the driver, although sometimes the commander could double as a gunner. Pick this one too because it does have a little turret. <laughs> Just having fun. But um, that helped a lot. And then the BTR 60P AI, later PB, was a further improved version. It had better protection for nuclear and chemical warfare. And it was able to mount either the 12.7 millimeter machine gun or the 14.5 millimeter truly heavy machine gun in the front. It is worth pointing out that the initial troop capacity of 14 would be reduced to 12 with the PA and down to 8 with the PB because of the armor and just what's going on. But, you know, it's, a, it's a still an even trade-off and uh, these vehicles were produced through the 1960s and into the 70s. They did try replacing the BTR-60 with the BTR-70, but it was only of limited success. It never really fully did. It wouldn't be until the BTR-80 in the Afghan era that they had um, an improved version that really stuck, and this would have several sub-variants. But the takeaway is that they had, um, you know, 8 to 14 troop transport that was in the mechanized uh, infantry here to get get them there and it was certainly a lot better and safer than walking but it had basically no fighting capabilities which is why we need this the infantry fighting vehicle model one series one the bmp one and for it hey let's look at the m577 from aliens because why not they are at least similar dimensions. <laughs> the uh, the BMP was truly a revolutionary design. It really spearheaded the APC concept and gave Russia an edge. 
Work began right after the BTR was put into production, around 1960-61. And in 66, it was officially adopted. But it would take a few years until they worked out the initial kinks and, um, you know, put it in for production. The 70s is when it started to really kind of come around. Unlike the BTR, it was armored from the get-go and it was designed for fighting, specifically anti-tank and other, uh, other ground things. To that end, it was armed with a 73 millimeter smooth bore, relatively low pressure, uh, semi-automatic cannon with 40 rounds. It also carried four anti-armor, anti-tank missiles that were manually loaded onto a launch rail. It could have other things instead put in that place or an addition. It also had a PKT machine gun with I think about 2,000 rounds. It was not bad. Coaxially mounted. It was about 23, well about 22 and some change feet long. A little under 10 feet in width. And it was capable of, of about 45 miles per hour on a road, dropping down to under 30 miles on rough terrain. But it was a tracked vehicle, so yeah, some advantages. And it too was amphibious. It could go about 5 miles per hour over water and used a jet system to maneuver as well. What's kind of neat is they could just go on the water. They didn't have to go out outside and really change anything up. All the changes could be done from inside the cockpit, which actually makes it better than uh, the 1980s Jeeps we used to have. We had to get out and, you know, lock the hubcap wheel things. The, uh, the crew. Well, in the front, in the kind of driver's compartment, you had two. You had the driver and you had the gunner who manned the turret. Now, there was the third member of the crew, like I said, who would be the squad leader. That was in the troop compartment, which was towards the back. It was a big, you know, dual row of benches with the eight crew there. They had a total of seven, excuse me, nine firing ports on the BMP-1, uh, four per side, plus one in the rear. And as is famously known, there were fuel tanks everywhere, one in the center and one small one in the, each door. There were rear doors, there were top hatches. You get the idea. It was pretty cramped in there. They had to carry all their gear inside, including all the guns and ammunition, which, as you can imagine, was a bit of a hazard. But it was armored and and sealed up against uh, nuclear and chemical warfare with a pressure system that's pretty famously known. Again, it was a very advanced, tracked, armored fighting vehicle slash APC for that day and time. And production would continue through 1982 and into 83 when it would finally be wrapped up and replaced by its successor that we'll talk about later. But yeah, the BMP-1 gave the mobile, the armored infantry, a, a good leg up. They could, they could have protection. Now, they would not typically fight in it using those ports only in last resort. Typically, they were safer to dismount because it wasn't all that proofed against uh, anti-tank missiles and bombs and what we would call IEDs itself. So, you know, it had shortcomings like anything, but it did well and they would build a lot of them. Uh, over 20,000 in Russia alone and several thousand more built outside of Russia. And of course they would go into Afghanistan and they would have the uh, the guns we're looking at on board. For more information, there's several great articles out there. So I just wanted to kind of bring attention to the BMP-1 series. Let's get back to guns. While the BTR started to see pretty heavy use in the 60s, the BMP is really what brought the motorized infantry squadron, platoon, into relevance and it did not really appear in numbers until the early or even mid-70s. And that was still during the time of the 7.62 I-39 cartridge. Now, that vehicle had seating 
for eight in the back plus two in the front and the commander kind of sat down and then the gunner was up in the turret like we talked about now they usually didn't load them up fully with the 10 or 11 people you could actually get 11 in if you really tried typically the squadron the unit there consisted of nine sometimes eight so what do we have and who used what <laughs> the crew consisted of the commander the BMP commander the gunner and the driver or pilot if you will <laughs> now, interestingly the commander did double duty the uh, bmp would drive up as close as they could typically they would try to get with about 200 meters of the target to disembark and they would dismount their steed and you would have six to seven members get out you'd have the, the ones in the, the back get out and the commander would swap hats becoming the uh, squadron leader on the ground typically if not always he had the rank of sergeant so while he was gone the bmp's gunner would kind of take over in his stead pulling double duty now that left two people in the uh, armor you had the driver who did driver things but he also doubled as the mechanic because heck if the thing's not working you really don't need a driver very solid logic there and he was just armed with a Makarov PM pistol now they never considered this an offensive gun of course they didn't it was simply for last-ditch self-defense in case the position was overrun so I brought out my Russian PM this is a great close range to medium-ish range self-defense gun the 9 by 18 cartridge packs quite a wallop. Very dirt simple, reliable, got all the features you need. It's essentially an overbuilt, more durable version of a Volter PPK, complete with wraparound grips. You know the deal. And if you don't, we've done several videos. And the gunner, now acting as uh, the APC, we'll call it, the BMP commander, he would have either a Makarov usually or sometimes especially when entering an active combat zone he would go for the AKMS the folding stock version mostly again because he's in the confines and he might need to deploy it like I said the BMP did have firing ports as well originally five on the one so yeah a good choice for him and that's who was uh, left on board so what about the guys charging out the back as quick as they could? <laughs> so after the BMP halts travel as close as it can to the target without being too close, the six core member squad will jump out the back as quick as possible, leaving their comrades inside to use the weapons on board the uh, carrier to defend them, the, the PKT, maybe even the cannon certainly the rockets and missiles, whatever they needed. And it was there, and it would continually provide cover, support, assistance throughout the, the mission. So once they get on the ground, they will split into two teams, the fire team and the maneuver team. The fire team will consist of four members. The maneuver or mobility team will consist of two now, the sergeant in charge, the squadron leader, will take command of the fire team. With him will be the grenadier, assistant grenadier, and the machine gunner. This team will mostly have AKMs. The squadron leader typically will have a fixed stocked AKM, although it's possible he could have an AKMS. Not surprisingly, the machine gunner would have an RPK, again, the fixed stocked version in this instance. And while 75 round drums were still around at this time, already they were going to issuing two 40 round 
pouches with the machine gun. And of course, AK magazines, typically three or four round pouches for 30 rounders would fit as well. Now, the Grenadier would have an RPG-7. Uh, sorry, I don't have one to show you. He would really only have a PM for defense, if even that. Sometimes he didn't even have a PM. And he would have usually two rockets. His assistant would usually have three rockets and would double as another rifleman, typically carrying the AKM again. So pretty straightforward there. Now the mobility or maneuver team would consist of the senior rifleman who was typically a corporal or similar rank and then a standard rifleman. And they again would have AKMs. Just kind of where we're at here. So that's six. There could be a seventh member if needed. Sometimes you would see an extra machine gun. Sometimes you would see a field medic. Often, if they needed someone, it would just be an extra rifleman. You know, just whatever needed a specialist. And sometimes just no one, especially if they're not in a super hot combat zone. Or if, you know, they're just short-staffed. So yeah, pretty typical stuff. Mostly AKMs, maybe one or two AKMSs floating around. Typically one RPK would be on board. And you'll see a couple of uh, Makarovs with the crew and maybe one or two on the ground with the uh, leaders and the grenadier. But not always. The Russians were reluctant to give privates, even corporals, handguns. And most of the rest of the members of the crew would be privates or private first class equivalents. And this is kind of how the squadron was arranged in the uh, 70s, really before the Afghanistan war and during the, uh, the early days. But of course that war would teach several lessons and of course we had a brand new gun to talk about. While named the AK-74 for the year 1974, in reality the design wasn't really totally finalized until 78-79 they were still tinkering with it a lot between 73 and that time. That's kind of how Soviets did things, not just with guns, but, well, armor and airplanes and everything else. So it wasn't until right before the Afghanistan war that enough AK-74s, along with their 5.45 ammunition, were available. And as you would expect, these replaced the AKM throughout time. One fun fact, for a while, even for years afterwards, a lot of old crusty sergeants hung on to their trusty AKMSs in Russia. Kind of reminds me of how some people hung on to the M14 even after the M16 was uh, accepted. So there would be a transition period where you might see both, especially again the folding stock version because these are mostly kept on board tanks for last ditch defense so they had pretty low round counts and as you know the RPK was replaced by the RPK 74 from Molot a brief time later essentially identical gun just in the smaller caliber new birdcage flash rider originally it had wood furniture but very quickly in the 80s around 84 they would go to this plum type they would also get away from a drum they never mass produced a drum for this rather they used a 45 round box magazine instead of 40 and they issued eight per gun and of course improved versions of the rpg7 would come around and the trusty old makarova was still in holsters on hips probably very actually very rarely pulled out but it was there if shit really hit the fan and frankly in Afghanistan that was much more likely but that was only the beginning at this time we start to see some specialized guns getting into the hands of uh, of the motorized infantry squadron 
and kind of developing tactics after real world experiences in the mountains there of Afghanistan. Let's check some out. I'm of course talking about the AKS-74U, the short version here, ignoring the doofy long barrel on this one. Had an eight and a half inch barrel, some machine gun sized, and it had the folding stock from the AKS-74. Funny thing, I've looked, and you would assume that the uh, motorized infantry would have the AKS-74. I'm sure they did. I can't find a single source that says they did. Almost seems like they jumped straight to this. So, a couple of members might pick these up. For example, the gunner inside the armored personnel carrier there might trade in his Makarov, well, he'll still keep his Makarov, but trade in his AKMS or nothing to have one of these, a lot shorter and lighter and more effective. Another one, that poor grenadier with the RPG-7, who really only had the Makarov, would get the option to start carrying an AKSU in the 1980s. So yay, self-defense. What a great thing when you have a single shot weapon. Better hope your squadron's not overrun. So those are the, kind of the two main users of the Krinkov as it became kind of unofficially known, in America at least. And I wouldn't be shocked if sometimes a squadron leader and or a driver managed to stick one of these away. And they were very popular with uh, Mill Mi-24 helicopter pilots as well. So a neat little variant and um, kind of showed the value in being compactness. It was very much a PDW and really made the Makarov become an absolute last line of defense gun. Kind of makes you wonder how often these ever actually got fired. And you do start to see sometimes two RPK 74s issued per squad, kind of filling that seventh role. And also, at some level, usually uh, one per platoon, so one out of every three squads, would replace either one RPK-74 or just add a PKM general purpose machine gun. Very similar to the PKT on board the BMP, but um, yeah, specialized for ground use. And speaking of the BMP and the 1980s in Afghanistan, by this time, a new improved version was uh, coming into service. So let's talk a bit about it. And now we return to the M577 APC from Aliens, because Colonial Marines are cool. And we want to talk about the advanced versions. The BMP-1 was good, but not great, especially its armament. It was kind of lacking, especially with the foes they went up against because they started fighting in Afghanistan. In 1980, the BMP-2 was introduced. And it was still based on the same basic chassis and hull, but it had an all-new turret with an all-new gun. It switched out the 73mm for a 30mm high velocity. There was a true auto-loading gun. A lot of times the semi-automatic system of the 73 was just, it didn't work great. They also updated the um, anti-tank missiles as well as making autocannon turrets and um, even grenade launchers more of a common feature. Although you can still find grenade launchers on the BMP-1s as well sometimes. It was modular. And it retained the PKT coaxial machine gun, as you would imagine. Now, the turret itself was interesting. The, uh, the, the front compartment still had the driver, but now the turret held two people, the gunner and the commander. Now, because of additional armor added and some redesign, the troop compartment was actually a little smaller. And it theoretically had seven seats, but in practice it was six, meaning that in practical terms, the maximum was nine on board, and often this was reduced further down to eight for a lot of operations. They did what they could to redesign things. It did lose a couple of firing ports going from nine on the original to seven. 
they re they took one out per side when they redesigned things. But it still had the same basic speeds. It was a little bit heavier. The BMP2 was a little heavier than the BMP1. But it also had a upgraded engine, so it made up for it. Still being a tracked vehicle, still amphibious, still meant to, uh, yeah. And this was a lot more successful, especially the new high-velocity 30mm cannon. And the BMP2, what a C4 rate production from 1980 through 1989, and low rate small batch production all the way up until 2005. That's when the Russian military took delivery of its last ones. Then there was also a BMP3 introduced in the 1990s. But it was a short production run. It was only coming into production right as the, end, the Soviet Union ended. Therefore, it never really took off. And production there would end in 1997. So, yeah. Some of the BMP-1s were upgraded to the BMP-1P standard, beginning in the late 70s. Otherwise, we had the BMP-2 and a handful of BMP-3s in the uh, Russian army. But again, they had thousands of these. So even though a lot, many were lost in Afghanistan, they had plenty more still for the Chechen Wars and the 21st century conflicts. And they're still very much in use today, although newer versions and replacements have been seen. And with that, let's get back to guns. Being developed in parallel with the AK-74 was an underbarrel single shot 40 millimeter grenade launcher which would become the GP 25 and it really would enter service around the same time as the rifle and these would start to trickle into the uh, motor squadrons in Afghanistan in the 80s now got my arsenal here but uh, since this is a earlier version this lugs off so I had to bring out the FR to show the lug here. You see this mentioned as an accessory lug on a lot of websites. Bayonet lugs up front. That's the main accessory, at least in the beginning, they were intended to use, the under barrel grenade launcher. It would clip on. And like I said, even though I can't find any evidence that the, uh, the motor infantry used the AKS-74, the airborne assault certainly did. At any rate, that was a new piece of equipment. It's kind of interesting. The Grenadier was actually an anti-tank person, you know, with the RPG-7. With this underbarrel launcher, we had more of a conventional grenade launcher. And typically, if a squadron had a unit, it would be issued to the, um, to the senior rifleman in the maneuver squadron, well, maneuver division, the, the corporal. So, yeah, we have kind of two people with the ability to do that, plus whatever's on the uh, the BMP at the time. So that was a useful upgrade. By the way, this pouch is 1980s from Afghan War period. So by this time, most of the 762 by 39 guns are out. 545 are in. I feel like we're missing one, though. Hmm... Is it the medic? Yeah, sometimes they would send a field medic in. He would even sometimes carry a Makarov or even an AKS-74U. Hmm, no. Was it another rifleman if they needed to bulk out the squad? Well, they certainly did that. Also, like I said, they would bulk them out with uh, an extra RPK-74. And by the mid and late 80s, once in a while, a squadron, usually about one per platoon, would have their 74 replaced with a PKM. Oh yeah, one in a platoon. That reminds me of what I'm thinking of. The SVD-63 Dragunov. And this is one thing that Russian motorized squadrons have been famous for, issuing a sniper rifle at the squadron level, the squad level. That's sort of true. The reality is they sometimes would add a seventh member to carry this, or 
they would replace the uh, rifleman that was operating on the maneuver team with uh, a sharpshooter. They weren't true snipers. Yeah, these are more of a maybe better than a DMR, but not a true sniper. Anyway, that's a debate for another day. So they would sub these in if and when needed. And typically, much like with the PKM, you would see one squad out of each platoon. Each platoon had three squads plus uh, command vehicles. So one of those would have the sharpshooter. And it was a good idea. It really worked out well. Kind of for balanced firepower, you still had the original AK-74 with its 16-inch barrel. Keep in mind, when the original AK-47 AKM was introduced, it was a very revolutionary concept, the assault rifle. It was much like a submachine gun, but with a lot more going on. So it was a well-rounded uh, thing, especially if we're operating in a vehicle. We might think of, this is a little long today with the fixed stock, but back then it was a heck of a lot shorter than, say, a Mosin or things that had come before. So well-rounded there, which is why the majority of guys carried it. And, of course, for a slightly longer range and suppression fire, keep their heads down, you got to have a machine gun. The RPK, RPK-74, they had the benefit of using the same magazines, the same ammo as the standard AK, and even a lot of the same small parts, like uh, trigger components. So even if one went down, uh, you could keep going. And the nice thing is you could uh, interchange ammo to keep the machine gunner going if you needed to keep the enemy's heads down. And while it does have a fixed barrel, which does limit it a bit, it's relatively lightweight, quite a bit lighter than the previous RPD. And it's uh, just pretty small for all, you know, for a machine gun, it's quite uh, compact there too, and it has the durability of a Kalashnikov. And again, it has a little bit longer range. Nothing, it's not a marksman gun, but a little bit. And for close-in, self-defense we have the AKS 74U again only a couple of these might appear in a uh, BMP or BTR grouping but uh, made sense it was lightweight high rate of fire you know you got to put the 45 round mag in one right and uh, well it's not a perfect gun for a last resort PDW it uh, was pretty damn good that's pretty cool, although it had a mixed reputation. And of course you have your RPG-7 and your uh, GP-25 for launching things. And you have support for those, plus everything on the vehicle itself. And so really to wrap things up, having a DMR or production grade sniper really rounded things out. And of course, much like with the PKM, PKT, machine guns this fired 762 by 54 r so it had about twice the range, give or take, of a standard AK, and still had greater range than the RPK, RPK-74, and these had perfectly acceptable accuracy standards, and they weren't particularly finicky, like you could drop them, drop them in the mud, beat them around, they weren't as fidgety as some truly custom-tuned sniper guns, and they were definitely minute of man, and then some. And while not quite as simple and inexpensive as the uh, Kalashnikov, they were still in that same vein. And so it really did kind of extend the capabilities and give a special capability. But this was not standard for all squadrons, at least not frequently. But one would be in each platoon, give or take, during the latter stages of the Afghan war. It's kind of funny, the Dragunov would kind of come in and out of uh, motorized squadron service over the years. There'd be times when they would issue them more, then they kind of back off, then they'd bring them back in. Of course, it feeds from a 10-round mag. Here's its pouch. Typically four mags in the pouch, perhaps a fifth one in the gun. And of course, we have our uh, four-power optic. This is a very good, dependable optic, if nothing fancy. And that's pretty much what Russia had at the end of the Afghanistan war and at the end of the 
Soviet Union. But it certainly wasn't the end of the Russian army, the BMP, the whole squadron systems, although things would slow down for a bit. And because of budget cuts and modern things, we would start to kind of reduce the number of uh, firearms and pieces of equipment. So let's kind of move into our final stage. And also let's talk a bit about what the airborne was driving, well, driving after it dropped out of the sky, again, hopefully with a working parachute. Ask Soyuz 1 what a non-working parachute is like. It, it's, not, it's not good. The Airborne, the VDB, the assault troops, used two craft, very much analogous to what the mobile infantry had. The BMD D, essentially meaning fighting vehicle, armored vehicle belonging to the Air Force, or the Air Troops, as I say, the Descent Forces, and the BTRD, standing for Armored Troop Carrier Descent Air Force, although actually the BTRD was not based on the BTR, it was based on the BMD, as confusing as that might be. And for our final one here, We've got the Landran from Battlestar Galactica. This is actually a really good fit because it, you know, size-wise and everything really is a lot like what they had. Well, after the decision had been uh, set upon to really mechanize and update the regular mobile, the regular infantry to be mobile units with the APCs and whatnot, it was decided in the mid and late 50s, around 56, 57, to do the same with the airborne troops. Now, Russia had airborne troops in World War II used against the Germans, and there they saw that um, they were very useful, but they also needed to combat enemy aircraft and enemy armor, namely tanks. And Russia had a very ambitious thing. They didn't want to just drop paratroopers. They wanted to drop paratroopers with armor. So after everything was kind of going and going with the standard vehicles, work really got started in the mid-60s on the BMD with early trials in 1967 and the very first production models in 1969 when it was adopted. And some early models were kind of glimpsed in 1970 and then they were shown off officially in 73, but they were still working on the design it was extremely demanding. It needed to be about seven tons unloaded so that the aircraft of the day could drop it. And the idea was to put it on a pallet with a drogue chute to pull it out of the airplane and then a um, main parachute to land it. And at first they were just going to land the vehicle unmanned and um, then the crew would meet up and get on board. Well, this didn't work out well. Uh, the vehicles could land in weird places and weird locations. They really needed to have crew on them. So then experiments began with uh, having crew members on, and they decided it would be good to have the two main crew, the driver and the gunner, actually drop in the vehicle. This work was in the 70s, and in 75, kind of benefiting from technology from the space program, they put a retro rocket on the pallet, meaning... Right before it touched down, it fired, slowing the descent to under 10 miles per hour, about 5 to 8, depending on its conditions. And then the rest of the crew would parachute out and join the, the craft, the, the armor, with uh, assistance from technology if needed. And this would mean that you had airborne units behind enemy lines and... They could travel faster and be defended in an armored vehicle and could potentially take on tanks or even defend themselves against aircraft. And the, um, the uh, BMD started to see heavy use in the 70s and was ready for the Afghanistan war. What we had, it was quite small, only about 17 and a half feet long. It was narrower than the BMP at about eight feet. It was a little overweight though, at about seven and a half tons unloaded. So close. 
And this minute can still be dropped by the IL-76, the, the Antonov AN-12, even by the Mil Mi-6 and Mi-26 helicopters. So it was pretty versatile. And it had the same 73 millimeter cannon and it could use the same missiles or grenade launchers, or what, have you, what have you, as the BMP-1. It was a pretty new design from the BMP-1, but it used a lot of the same components and just kind of notions. But of course, the trade-off was the size and the armor. This was uh, one of the earlier vehicles in Russia, maybe even the first to go into full production, that had an alloy armor instead of just plate steel. It had that crew of two, like I told you about, but internally, the BMD-1 was very cramped. It only had a dismount of a total of four. You had three members in the crew compartment, in the back, the troop compartment. And then up front, you had the driver, the gunner, and the commander. So a total of six on board, four of them meant for dismount. So a smaller squadron versus six to seven, but behind enemy lines, and they were well armed for, for what it was. The, uh, the internal usually had, and it would drop with the, uh, with the armor here, we had five AKMS rifles, let it replace with the AKS-74, of course. You had the RPG-7, later... The Airborne would replace this with the RPG-16. And you had the RPKS light machine gun, later replaced by the RPKS-74. So that kind of gives you an idea of what's on board here. By the way, speed-wise, it's capable of reaching up to 50 miles per hour on a road, nearly 30 miles per hour cross-country, and because it is a little bit lighter, it can get to about six miles per hour, even a little faster sometimes, over water. Still amphibious. So yeah, it drops from the sky, it can go across water. The uh, BMP-1 was a pretty impressive craft, as was the later B, excuse me, uh, BTR. The, uh, the troop transport version was basically a BMD with the turret system removed. This made a lot more room, and they would um, also extend the crew compartment. It was about 22 feet long, but since it didn't have the turret, it wasn't all that much heavier. It could carry a crew of two and up to 10 fully equipped passengers, so a total of 12. So this helped complement things. By the way, the BMD-1 had a total of three firing slits, one on each side and one in the back. Again, very cramped crew compartment. In fact, so cramped, they didn't actually have a back door. They had to use the side and top to kind of get out, but, you know, needs must. Now, this, uh, the, both the, uh, the transport and the fighting vehicle were in use in Afghanistan in 79 and 1980, and they were instrumental in capturing and maintaining a hold on the cities until the main infantry could get there. Again, very red donish. But Afghanistan showed that, uh, you know, there, there was room for improvement. So the BMD-2 was developed in the early 80s and went into production in 85 and would be produced up through the end of the Soviet Union. And it was uh, just, you know, further improvement. It had the 30 millimeter high velocity cannon of the BMP-2. Several updates there, including to the armor but essentially it was the same craft with the same equipment. There would even be a BMD-3 that was just about, it was going into production in 1990 right, at the, right as the Soviet Union was ending, and it would be produced in limited numbers, only 100, 130. It was a larger, heavier version, about 20 feet long. It could carry an extra crew or a trooper in the back, and it had additional firing ports and so on and so forth. But it was a limited, and it was just mostly a victim of its timing. It would evolve into the BMD-3M modernized, which would become the BMD-4, which is still in service very much to today. 
the Airborne uh, still has a lot of these vehicles, over 1,800. Most of them are the BMD-1 upgraded to the BMD-1P. There's a few hundred BMD-2s and about 100 BMD-3s, which have been upgraded to the BMD-4 standard, as far as I know. And to complement them, they have nearly 300 of the BTR-D tra transport version. And uh, yeah, I just it's a very cool concept and something that no one else was thinking about in the 60s. I just think it's wild that they were dropping armor out of aircraft with crew on board and on top of that they could swim yeah <laughs> but with that let's return to guns and wrap things up and the first step here was what we know today as the AK-74M and this was really a combination of several updates introduced throughout the Afghanistan war it is Ishask, later Ishmash corrected and improved things and ad adopted new technology and it was a bit of an ongoing project and the idea was to replace several older guns the AK-74, the AKS-74, the, even the AKSU-74 kind of a one to replace three and to address some of the issues with the crank and whatnot and the major thing is we still have a 16 inch barrel but we have a folding stock now as standard and for what it's worth although it's not really important to us right now unless we're doing night vision a scope rail became standard but we've done plenty of videos on this by the way even into the 90s the Makarov PM is still the standard they did try replacing it with newer guns or even an updated version known as the Makarov PMM but nothing really stuck because of budget cuts but the uh, AK-74M was a pretty big success and it did allow them to replace several guns. Beginning around 94, the AKSUs, AKS-74s, and AK-74s, if they were worn out, would be replaced by the AK-74M. Of course, if they weren't worn out, they would keep using them until they were because waste not, want not. Now you might think, that they would go for the AK-105, the 12-inch barrel and 545 version, which is part of the Century series, to replace the crank. But for whatever reason, they did not. They went to this. I guess they figured the synthetic furniture and the folding stock made it light enough and compact enough that it could just replace this. And to be fair, it would be good to have kind of a more like the beginning when most people in the squadron squad had the AKM now we're going to most people having the AK 74M and along with it a new version of the underbarrel grenade launcher was introduced at least eventually the GP 30 it was modernized and lightened and had better sighting systems so the GP 25 would be phased out in favor of the GP 30 over time so we're continuing to do things. And with the success of the rifle, that got them to think about replacing some of the other aging guns as well. Well, we cannot have an AK-74M without having an RPK-74M. Following Ij Hesk Ijmash's lead, Molot introduced much of the same uh, changes and updates including of course the folding stock here which uh, is not quite as easy to release because it's tougher for being dropped on things folding stocks are just kind of the new the new norm makes perfect sense one size fits all these kinds of folding stocks you really don't sacrifice anything the same with having a scope rail and if you don't need it good to have it they also updated manufacturing a bit and tried to do what they could to improve accuracy and also make these more cost effective. And uh, these have been introduced a little bit later and enter in slowly because a lot of the RPK 74s were not worn out yet. But as they wore out, they would be replaced by the RPK 74M throughout the late 90s and 2000s. Still firing 545 by 39 for both of these and 
small numbers of the AK-105 were purchased. But again, I can't really find evidence of them actually being used in the BMPs. But that's not to say they weren't. And likewise, the Dragonovs were updated. Mine is kind of set up in a late 90s style here with the woodstock. It was kept. They went to a synthetic handguard. Then they went to a synthetic stock. And, uh, just, you know, basic updates. And, of course, there was also the SVDS folding stock with a slightly shorter barrel version for the uh, paratrooper assault forces. And guess what? We're finally going to replace the sidearm. Eventually. <laughs> I think today the standard is the MP443. But I don't have one of those because we don't really get pistols out of Russia. But I've got a Glock, so let's talk about Glocks. Along with pretty much everyone else, to some extent, Russia has purchased some Glock pistols for issuance to Special Forces, FSB, and, if not the, uh, the motor, uh, motorized infantry squadrons, they are, they are used by the Airborne. And they're just Glock 17s. The problem is, my Glock 17 is a Generation 1. So I grabbed my Glock 34 Generation 3 because it's cool and I like it. <laughs> it's definitely not the standard pistol, but they do have some. And more importantly, they've moved away from 9 by 18 PM, 9 by 18 Makarov, and have gone to the standard 9 by 19 NATO Luger Parabellum. But again, they're still retaining 545 and they're even retaining 762 by 54R for the Dragonov and the PKM, meaning it served for well over a century. And this is where I pretty much have to stop and where they stopped for a while. But of course, there is an even newer generation of guns, but we can't get some autos of them here. I'm talking, of course, about the AK 12, the RPK 16, and the PK. P, which is a general purpose machine gun to replace the PKT and PKM. It's kind of an interesting gun. It's also worth pointing out that modern uh, platoons today either have four PKPs or they'll have one PKM and three RPK-74Ms, just depending on kind of where they're at in their transition. I believe pretty much all of the AKSUs, all the cranks are out of active service now. There might be a handful hanging on. Like I said, sometimes the old timers really do hang on to the old stuff. And while the AK-12 is starting to see service, the majority, they're still equipped with the AK-74M. And even some older AKS-74s and AK-74s can be found if you look hard enough. Because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Same thing goes for the RPKs. You can still find some RPK-74s and RPKS-74s in Russian service. In fact, it's, it's, it has not been declared obsolete yet. Because uh, really the differences are just manufacturing updates and a few ergonomic changes. But all in all, pretty much the same gun. And uh, Russian tactics with the BMPs and BTRs it really didn't get updated until the 2010s, the, the last decade. In fact, they actually looked woefully outdated when seen like in Chechnya and Georgia earlier on. But they've learned and they've done what they can to modernize, but to do so on a budget. So what do you think? Today, while the SVD, at least later versions, are still in use, it's being replaced by the SV-98 and, and others, including a bullpup version and the VSS. You know the deals. You can look it up. But they're still around, and that still gives long-range fire accurate. We still have a relatively light and easy-to-mass-produce machine gun in the RPK. And, of course, the PKP is an interesting melding of older and new features for a heavier or at least medium machine gun quite interesting i'd love to get my hands on one but for whatever reason i've always had a super soft spot for the ak-74m 
I think because while it is clearly a modernized gun, it still has that simple ruggedness of Kalashnikovs. When I when I think about newer ones like the AK-12, AK-15, they they seem to lose a bit because they have more attachments and more features, which I know you have to do to stay modern. But this is still almost the same exact gun that Mikhail Kalashnikov developed in 1940s. Just, you know, newer furniture, of course, in a different caliber, and uh, with some new rail systems. But the guts, the core, along with that of the RPK, really, are the same that dated back to the Soviet days. So, I don't know. I just was trying to think of an interesting video topic, and I really do find the BMPs and, and BMDs and BTRs very interesting uh, craft. And just the whole uh, squadron system that they have been using since the 1970s. And it has been updated and modernized, but it's still more or less intact today. So this is more of a palette wetner. There you go. That's a word. I've been talking for a while. I'm tired. If you're interested, check it out. There's some great videos on, on YouTube, some in English, many in Russian. Yeah. Unfortunately, some of the best websites for information on the armor seem to be down. I just checked before doing this video, and they're still down, unfortunately. But I uh, wanted to do something to kind of kick the new week off. Hope you enjoyed it. Please feel free to comment, as usual. Hope you're having a great day. If you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to the Patreon page. As always, I do greatly appreciate it, for real. This is Misha. And I'll catch you very soon next time.